Introduction to Contracts, and the Second Restatement Contracts. With this unit, we begin our study of the Restatement of Contracts, Second Edition. The Restatement of Contracts is one of a number of restatements of the law, which are periodically issued by the American Law Institute. The ALI is a national organization of legal experts. Its primary purpose is to draft and revise the restatements. The first restatement of contracts was issued in 1932. It was largely the vision of Professor Samuel Williston and reflected a formalistic philosophy of contract law. Formalism assumed the law could be organized into a set of coherent rules that, when properly applied, would lead to consistent results. The restatement of contracts was revised in 1979. It is this second version of the restatement that we will be studying. The second restatement was largely the vision of professors Arthur Corbin and Carl Llewellyn. Their philosophy of contract law was less focused on precise formulas and more informed by pragmatics. It tended more toward policy making and preferred to set standards such as a reasonable time rather than precise rules. The official purpose of each restatement is to restate the common law based on a survey of cases from all state jurisdictions. Each restatement addresses a particular area of law, such as contracts or torts. The goal was for each restatement to accurately summarize the current state of the law in each area, that is, to state the black letter law. It is important to understand that the restatements are not themselves law in the sense of being binding authority or legislation. Sometimes, however, a particular restatement section will become law if it is adopted by a particular judge in a specific jurisdiction. At that point, the restatement section so adopted becomes part of that state's common or judge-made law. Let's begin at the beginning. With Section 1 of the Restatement of Contracts, second, Section 1 is short and sweet and provides us with the definition of the word contract. This section is often paraphrased as, a contract is an enforceable promise. If you think about it for a moment, you will realize that this is not the usual meaning of the word contract. In fact, section 1 is necessary because contract has several common meanings. It often refers to the written document, signed by both parties, that sets out the party's agreement. Sometimes, however, parties have an oral agreement, that is, they do not write anything down but instead orally agree to certain terms. And sometimes the parties have a written document, but in addition they have orally agreed to one or more supplemental terms beyond those set out in the writing. So in some cases, contract can also refer to the actual agreement of the parties, which is not set out or not completely set out in a written document. It is a common misconception among non-lawyers that there is no contract if there is no writing. But that is not always the case. Many oral agreements are just as legally binding as a written agreement. The specific meaning of the word contract as used in the restatement presents us with a conundrum. If a contract is a legally enforceable promise, we can't actually know what is or is not a contract until and unless the enforceability of the promise is litigated in a court of law. The comments to section 1 try to finesse this by saying that when a promise is described as binding, a synonym for legally enforceable, it means that there is a legal duty to perform the promise if the promisor has full capacity, if there is no illegality or fraud in the transaction, if the duty has not been discharged, and if there are no other similar facts which would defeat the prima facie duty which is stated. Those are a lot of ifs. So is the restatement saying that a contract is a legally enforceable promise, unless it's not? Actually, no. What the restatement is saying is that a contract is a promise which has been made in such a way that we can presume a court will enforce it unless and until one party establishes that they have a defense against enforcement or an excuse for not performing. Defenses and excuses in this context will refer to legally recognized justifications for not performing the contract, and later in the course, we will examine these in some depth. There are millions of contracts made every year, and the overwhelming majority of them never see a courtroom. 
the parties do what they have promised to do, and they move on. The parties act if they have a contract in the restatement sense of the word, meaning a legally enforceable set of promises without ever putting it to the test by asking a court to decide whether their mutual promises are legally enforceable. It is only a tiny fraction of the contracts made in any given year, only the tip of the iceberg, that ever involve problems. And most of those problems are resolved without involving the judicial system. Contracts that result in litigation are truly the tiny tip of the tip of the iceberg. But of course, those are the contracts we will be studying. Section 1 says in effect that a contract is a legally enforceable promise. What is a promise? Let's look at Section 2 for the answer. In Section 2, Subsection 1, the restatement provides us with a definition of promise. Note that subsections 2 through 4 of Section 2 basically provide us with some vocabulary words. Promisor is the one making the promise. Promisee is the one to whom the promise is made. And a beneficiary is one who is not a party to the agreement, but stands to benefit from it. An important aspect of the restatement definition of promise is that it establishes what is called an objective standard for determining whether someone has made a promise. The section defines promise as a manifestation of intention that justifies the promisee's understanding that the promisor is making a commitment. So the section requires an external sign. For example, spoken words or a handshake, these are manifestations which a reasonable person would understand to be making a commitment. To put this the other way around, the promisor's internal intention is not what the section is looking to. So, here's an example. In a famous contract case, Lucy versus Zemer, Zemer wrote the words, I promise to sell the Ferguson farm on a bar tab receipt. When Lucy tried to enforce the sale, Zemer said he was only joking. In its opinion, the court weighs carefully the context in which Zemer's promise was made to determine whether a reasonable person standing in Lucy's shoes would have understood it was a joke. Ultimately, the court decides that even if Zemer was joking, Lucy was justified in believing he was serious. Consequently, the court orders Zemer to sell Lucy the property. Under the objective theory of contracts, it doesn't matter what your secret intent is. What matters is what you do and say.